whatever time zone that you are in um, for our first online graduate symposium, A Link to the Past, Creating Relevancy in the Humanities and Social Sciences. My name is Cassie, and I'm the president of the University of Calgary's Classics and Religious Studies Departmental Graduate Association, and I cannot overstate how excited we are to be able to offer this conference in an online format this year. And before I begin with introductions, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, compromising the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspot, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and I would also like to note that the University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsi, which we now call the City of Calgary. So over the course of our conference, discussions regarding the public relevancy within humanities and social sciences will be brought to light, with this discussion furthered through our thought-provoking keynote presentations from Dr. Maria Oschakaya, this evening, March 12th, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And Marina Fisher, tomorrow, March 13th, from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. And our workshops by Marina Fisher, who is also speaking tonight, March 12th, from 1 to 2 p.m. And Dr. Lisa Hughes, tomorrow, March 13th, from um, 12.30 to 2 p.m. We hope that you can join us for all these wonderful events over the course of the next few days. We would also like to extend a huge thank you to the Calgary Institute for Humanities for their sponsorship of our two keynote speakers, Dr. Mia Maria Ostakaya and Marina Fisher, as well as the Classics, Religion, Anthropology and Archaeology or CRAG interdisciplinary group and the Clare Department at the University of Calgary, whom without this conference, it would not be, po uh, whom without their support, this conference would not be possible. A thank you for our keynote speakers and workshop leaders as well, Dr. Maria Ostrakaya, Dr. Lisa Hughes, and Marina Fisher for giving up their valuable time to speak with us and teach under these extremely hectic circumstances. Thank you to our department and office, especially Courtney, who's joining us today for all of your support and assistance throughout the conference's conception and finally realization. And we would like to extend a thank you to each of our panelists for submitting such wonderful abstracts. We are excited to hear from each of you and what you have prepared and get to know you a little better over the course of this weekend. The format for our graduate and undergraduate panels consists of a 20 minute presentation followed by a 20, uh, 10 minute question period. So without further ado, to lead off our first panel, it is my privilege to in introduce to you our first speaker, Scott Coleman. Scott Coleman is a second year master's student in Greek and Roman studies at the University of Calgary. And Scott graduated from Memorial University of Newfoundland with a Bachelor of Arts honors in a with a major of history, a minor in English and a diploma in ancient worlds in the spring of 2019. His primary research interests are in medieval Roman rural sediment identity and their interactions with the imperial state, Roman Byzantine, oh, Byzantine numismatics, I'm so sorry, you guys, numismatics and cultural heritage and the use of gender and queer theory in medieval Roman archaeology. Scott's master, uh, master's research focuses on settlement identity on the medieval Roman inhabitants of Chatterhoyuk archaeology product, uh, project in north central Anatolia, Turkey. Scott is exploring the site's possibility dated, possible day-to-day -day operations during the 11th century, and he has studied at Chatterhoyuk Archaeology Project since 2016. And Scott will be pursuing his PhD in public history at Carleton University in the fall of 2021. So without further ado, it's off to you, Scott. Thanks, Cassie. Appreciate it. All right. Um, I'm assuming I have the ability to share my screen. Yes, that's correct. That should okay. be the case. One sec. Yep, you're all good. Yeah. All right. So as you can see, uh, my topic is De Hesse, uh, a call for the reevaluation of ethnicity and identity in the seventh century. Um, so let me begin. Uh, in, in telling the difference, in the book, Telling the Different Signs of Ethnic Identity, Walter Pohl asked a straightforward question. How can peoples be identified? Pohl, discussing the Western Roman Empire, begins his chapter discussing the various ways those who resided in the Roman Empire 
perceived outside groups. Language, culture, customs, religion, clothing, and even weaponry, uh, weaponry sorry, are all used to form distinctive traits to categorize non-Roman groups into ethnic groupings. Pohl concludes that the ancient authors never agreed on the appearance of various Germanic groups. The author also warns scholars that the use of archaeological evidence to ex extract identity for particular groups must be used with caution, as in most cases, the literary, and I quote, the literary attempts to tell the difference between Gentis, tribe, clan, nation, or people, cannot be reinforced by material culture and vice versa, end quote. Based on Pohl's discussion, I ask, how do Byzantine archaeologists and historians address issues of ethnic identities in the early Byzantine period? The following paper is an excerpt from a larger work that focus on, focuses on the settlement of Dehes, one of approximately 700 villages located in the limestone massive of northwestern Syria, also known as the Dead Cities. In this talk, I focus on the broader themes for the application of either Byzantine or Arab identity to the region of the limestone massive between the 6th and 8th centuries. This is what I refer to as the early Byzantine period. The paper's goal is to present the colonial and Orientalist tropes that continue to be embedded in, Byz in Byzantine scholarship that misrepresents the identities associated to these regions' histories. Thus, I shall just demonstrate that the methods used by Byzantine scholars to apply identity to material culture across Palestine and Syria have misrepresented, as well as erased, entire groups of people. The argument will also demonstrate that the application of labels such as Arab as an ethnic identity to groups of people in the 7th century Greater Syrian and Palestine regions is ineffective for understanding the diversity of identities that existed in these areas. Such sweeping claims of either Byzantine or Arab identity for the 6th and 8th centuries um, were established from nationalist ide ideology and modern society, and sorry, and how modern society defines ethnicity. The binaries of Byzantine and Arab creates a combative narrative that pits one group against another. But first, a brief history of the research performed in Byzantine identity and the limestone massive needs to be discussed before moving forward. Archaeological evidence to support identity claims is a relatively new debate within Byzantine studies and has not been fully addressed by Byzantinists. Indeed, it is only the past, in the past decade or so that the discussion about ethnic identity of those who lived within Byzantium is beginning to be discussed by a handful of Byzantinists. Anthony Candelis, in his book Roman Land, is one such person who questions modern Byzantine scholarship's incessant use of inaccurate terminology such as the term Byzantine itself, and critiques the refusal of Byzantine studies to engage in any critical discussion about ethnicity. Cal Dallas believes that the lack of engagement is due to the field's slow, even reluctant nature to modernize his theoret the, its theoretical framework in approaching Byzantine history. He argues that those who resided within Byzantium primarily refer to themselves as Romans of Romania, which is translated into Roman land. <clears throat> Caldellus's sources are many, utilizing those from the inner elite such as Procopius of the uh, 6th century, Syriac sources from the fringes of the Roman world, to Arabic liter uh, literature distinguishing Romans as Rum from Slavs and Franks. Caldellus claims, claims that in order for the field of Byzantine studies to move forward, scholars need to study identity through the claims and narratives made by the culture in question. However, Caldellus himself appears to perform the very fallacy he claims to begrudge Byzantinus for, that is, applying a broad ethnic identity to a particular group of peoples from the modern Middle East, or what is known as the modern Middle East, that the evidence does not appear to support, namely using the term Arab or Arab world to identify a group of peoples over a large geographic area. One must ask, does Arab, what does Arab mean in this context? This fallacy applies to all Byzantinists who misuse the term Arab when addressing the 7th century Syria-Palestine regions. In his seminal work, uh, Village Antique de la Syrie du Nord, George Teleshenko provided the first extensive archaeological survey and analysis of settlement remains at the limestone massive. 
Teloshenko argued that the devastating effects of the wars the Romans fought against the Sassanids and Arabs in the seventh century led to the region's economic collapse. Teloshenko believed that monoculture of olive oil production and its exports across the Mediterranean Sea made the villages prosperous until access to trade routes were cut off indefinitely by the Arab conquest. And I quote that, sorry. George Tate, in his book, Le, Le Compagnon de la Syrie du Nord, disagrees with Teloshenko and argues that the construction of new houses and prosperity of the village ceased by the mid-sixth century. Tate, however, also argues that the occupation in some of the houses was continued until the 10th century and supports his arguments for continual occupation with ceramic and numismatic evidence recovered from de Hess. Tate also argues that the decline and impoverishment of the villages followed after 550 CE, a claim that Jody Magnus argues in the archaeology of early Islamic settlement in Palestine, is meant to reflect the transition of Byzantine occupation to Muslim occupation in Syria. Both Teloshenko and Tate avoid discussions of identity and applying broad simplistic labels to identify those who inhabit the limestone massive and de Hesse. Their primary focus was on the archaeological evidence for the economic history of the region. In Chris Wickham's work, Framing the Early Middle Ages, the author also focuses on the economic structures of the dead cities and provides and proceeds with an overview of the pottery evidence recovered from de Hesse and the limestone massive. However, Wickham also performs the same fallacies as the previously mentioned authors. Referring to Phoenician red slipware and coins recovered from de Hesse, and elsewhere in the limestone massive, Wickham states that there is a substantial number of uh, Phoenician, Phoenician red slipware for a rural site, peaking in the 7th and 8th centuries, and including Byzantine coins into the 670s, even though northern Syria was Arab, from 638. The distinction made here by Wickham is problematic no matter how you approach the terminology. Wickham separates the ancient people's who used the material culture recovered at De Hesse into two groups, those who were Byzantine and those who were Arab. This duality oversimplifies a very dynamic period of time that was lived by people with a multitude of identities. It also insinuates whether it was Wickham's intention or not that Arabs did not use coins or that they did not live in the region before the rise of Islam and the subsequent Muslim invasion period. This claim, I argue, is false, and this duality, as Fred Donner argues, simply does not exist. Fred Donner also notes, in talking about Islam's origins, that the problem of terminology is prevalent when addressing the rise of Islam in the 7th century. Donner argues that in the 7th century, many of the invaders did not have a unifying concept of Arab as an ethnic identity, nor did they use the terms Islam or Muslim Rather, many of the peoples were referred to in the literary sources as Muminin, or the believers, and that this term ap appears in the Quran more than Muslim and Islam do. Walter Pohl cautions scholars about using grave goods as evidence for ethnic identities in the West, and that typologies established by modern archaeologists do not necessarily reflect late antique perceptions and are often hard to synthesize with the terminology known from our historical sources. Therefore, one must ask, how do ancient sources discuss differences in identity in the Roman provinces of Syria, Palestine, and Arabia? And are these differences represented in archeological record? In her PhD thesis, People and Identities in the Sana, Rachel Strumza, examines how identity is discussed in the Nisana Papari and argues that the people of Nisana, which is located in the lower uh, Levant or uh, southern, just south of um, the southern part of uh, Israel, do not define themselves as one ethnic group and that the tomb inscriptions found there in Nisana are silent about the people's provenance. The author also clarifies that it is rare to obtain a one-to-one -one correlation between a single piece of archaeological evidence and ethnic identity. Furthermore, Strumza argues that the term Saracen is used multiple times in the Sana Papyri and may have many applications, none of which really signify an ethnic identity, an assumption made by many scholars in the past. 
She also concludes that the term Arab is meaningless to those who inhabited Nisana in the sixth and seventh centuries. Um, if we look to the uh, 10th century uh, history of Al-Tabari, the author discusses numerous identities being portrayed within the region of Northern Syria. He notes referring back to um, the, the, uh, the beginning of the uh, Muslim invasions that the history notes uh, such groups as the Ghassan, the uh, Balkan, as well as the tribe of Sakun and the tribe of Bali. Strumza stresses that the application of ethnic labels such as Arab is never a neutral act and that the categorizing of groups is an exercise of power by one group over another. The application of, label, of the label Arab is one example of this exercise of power to categorize and simplify a group of people who did not necessarily identify as such in the 6th and 7th centuries. In the book Non-Muslims in the Early Islamic Empire, Milka Levy Rubin explores the roots of the surrender agreements that formulated the construction of the Sharut Umar, also known as the Pak of Umar. The goal of Levy Rubin is to understand the transition period of the 7th century and how Muslim and non-Muslim relationships were constructed. <clears throat> in Al, um, and I apologize, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not good at this name, Al Al Tutushi's version of the Sharut Amar, and noted by Levi Rubin, it was it is stated, "We, uh, people of the book, shall not build in our cities or in the near in their neighborhood, new monasteries, churches, convents, or monk cells. Nor shall we repair by day or night such of them as fall in ruins or situated in the quarters of the Muslims." This particular law is significant for the case of Dehes and other settlements that appear to be primarily of Christian inhabitants because it may provide insight to why settlements appear to have declined during the seventh century. As argued by both Tate and Teloshenko, Dehes was argued to have declined in prosperity and stagnated by the mid sixth century and on through the seventh century until the settlement's eventual abandonment in the ninth and 10th century. However, none of the studies about Dehes has addressed this law that I'm aware of and therefore may have overlooked a major piece of evidence to why the settlement appears to have stagnated. We do have to recognize that there is the possibility that a fully formed law may not have been implemented in the region of the limestone massive during the early stages of the transition of power from Rome, from the Roman state to the Islamic caliphs. However, agreements had to be put into place because in some provinces, provinces, the Christians were the majority population, and the caliphs wanted to maintain order and depopulation. Levi Rubin also points out that the Islamic conquerors were the minority group for the initial period of the political control of these regions. And as I noted above, the, the names of multiple groups within the Al-Tabari text, many of these groups also identified as Christians and were not necessarily Muslim themselves. Jody Magnus, in her book, uh, The Archaeology of Early Islamic Settlement in Palestine, takes issue with Tate's assessment of decline and impoverishment and reassesses the archaeological evidence presented from Dehes. Magnus notes that the parapet plaque is a significant uh, part to understanding the evolution of the settlement's identity as it contains both Greek and Syriac inscriptions. Yet this is not thoroughly addressed by the scholars Tate or Teloshenko, and Tate reports that Tate's report translates the Greek only, but was unable to translate the Syriac, thus possibly, possibly misattributing the identity of the settlement and those who lived within it. Also, if the Syriac was inscribed in a more haphazard way, this evidence can help identify settlement identity and provide a chronology for the inhabitants who lived in Dehes if the inscription can be dated later than the Greek. Magnus also concludes that by the late sixth century, most, if not all inhabitants, of uh, Dehes were probably Christian and supports her claim by citing the presence of crosses on late Roman seaware and as decor on houses. Magnus also claims that there is no direct archaeological evidence that suggests the population did not remain entirely or partially Christian after the Muslim conquest. This is significant as this supports that the population continued to live in Dehes uninterrupted but may have been restricted to improving religious and other institutional structures by the agreements and laws put in place by the new caliph. Alan Walmsley's article, The Village Ascendant, sorry, The Village Ascendant in Byzantine and Early Islamic Jordan, 
The author argues that new evidence from survey and archaeological projects are demonstrating that Islamic conquest barely interrupted village growth in the Jordanian countryside. Wamsley argues that the interpretation of village de development and expansion based on architectural features in the 6th century is only one part of a larger widespread development of settlement profiles. Therefore, the decline of settlements in the face of Islamic incursions needs to be reassessed away from Hellenized ideals. Rather, population rearrangement should be taken into consideration, resulting in a shift in the lifestyle and how settlements function in the 7th and 8th centuries. Such population relocation or rearrangements performed by invading groups was not unusual. It can be argued that this is also the case for the dead cities of the limestone massive, which includes De Hesse. Therefore, to conclude, this paper has presented a small sample of evidence from multiple regions throughout Palestine and Syria. Each analysis has demonstrated the current generalizations of Arab Islamic conquest and stagnation, impoverishment, and decline are anachronistic and need to need reevaluation. Fred Donner has demonstrated that in the seventh century, a unifying concept of Arab and Arabness as ethnic identity did not exist. Rather, most Muslim calls themselves sorry. Rather, most Muslims call themselves believers or mu'minin. While Rachel Strumza demonstrated that not all of the inhabitants of Nasana identified as Arabs. Jody Magnus correctly argues that the archaeological data from De Hesse demonstrates that prosperity continued into the 7th century. And Alan Walmsley has argued that repopulation and lifestyle need to be considered when approaching the Islamic incursions and settlement function, while Hellenized ideals of architecture are Eurocentric and need to be reassessed. The evidence suggests that a multitude of identities existed in, in, all the, uh, in all the discussed regions and the labels of Arab and Byzantine are no longer valid when examining rural and urban settlements of the seventh century. This is specifically true of De Hesse and given only three houses were actually excavated at the settlement, applying tropes of decline, stagnation and abandonment in the face of Arab or Islamic conquests are invalid. Therefore, skepticism must be applied to archaeological data of De Hesse when exploring ethnic identity in the 7th century until more intensive analysis of data can be undertaken to remove the colonial tropes that have existed for more than a century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, for that talk that uh, deals with some very prevalent issues today with ethnicity and identity. Um, we have our first question here so far in the chat from Sydney. Of course. <laughs> and she asks you, do you think there is any room for using broad ethnic identities in Byzantine research? Why or why not? So I'm assuming like just using terms at, like Arab in Byzantine research? Yeah, those ethnic identities that you were referring to. Um, I think what we need to do is be very careful in how we apply them, right? And we need to understand the chronology of the period in which they're being applied. So like in this particular paper, the more, the bigger version of it, I go into, I, I my research found lots of different identities uh, within the literature. So this is just not in the Nasana papyri, but also in the, um, uh, the Petra papyri and a few other um, Arabic sources. So we have to be very careful because many of them are actually referring to tribal names or religious associations. They just don't really say Arab. So, and then in, in the case of Byzantine, which uh, anybody who knows me, I really, even in this paper, I don't like using it because it really misrepresents who even those people were because many of them identified actually as Romans, as an ethnic group. Um, so we have to be careful and we really have to clarify on how we use these broad terms. And this is a problem. I, I, if you clarify it, I think it's not an issue. You got to make sure you're very specific in what you're saying. But I find a lot of, of the earlier scholarship and even up into modern day scholarship still just applies these terms haphazardly and they just don't clarify them. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, just as a reminder as well to all of our audience members, please feel free at any point to send messages through in the Q&A. Um, Sydney here also has another follow-up question. 
which is how does using different terminology for Byzantine complicate or aid making out work relevant to the non-academic public? And do you think using the term Byzantine makes our work more or less accessible? I, th I think our, the use of the term Byzantine makes our work less accessible. And the reason for this is it is just embedded with colonial and orientalist tropes of othering of a, a group of people that we in the West just see as this kind of weird society that's decadent. And this is part of what I will be exploring in my PhD thesis is how do we uh, deconstruct this label to make it more accessible to the general public. And this is part of what I've done with my um, coin research and how we present coins as either Roman or Byzantine, even though the people understood themselves as Roman. So I th think the term Byzantine does um, isolate um, academics into a little niche area that makes it very inaccessible to uh, the general public because when we start using these terms and we discuss it amongst ourselves, we have this kind of understanding of this hidden ethnic identity of the people, but we don't blatantly say it. So when people hear the term Byzantine, they think of kind of like how it's been presented throughout history as this orthodox, decadent, um, kind of effeminate culture that um, really we don't care about because the West is far superior than these people who were in the East, yet these people were the Romans and they weren't as, um, they're not, I'm trying to find the proper words here, but they're just not what we deem as an effeminate or decadent society is very complex. It was a continuation of the Roman world, the Roman empire, they understood themselves as Romans, but the region itself was very multi-ethnic. You know, there's groups of Armenians and Bulgars and all sorts of peoples that lived in these regions. So yeah, I think uh, we do make it inaccessible for people. And this is part of the problem of why we can't move forward. Now, I have a question for you. Do you think that through breaking down the controversy surrounding or issues surrounding the ethnicity and identity of the term Byzantine, if we broke that down, would it allow for more interdisciplinary scholarship and the opportunity for collaboration between other disciplines? Yeah, I do. And I and it's starting to happen. So Anthony Keller Ellis, uh, Leonora Neville are two prime examples who are starting to really break this down and really try to uh, remove this kind of term Byzantine. And and even, um, who was it? Um, I think it was even Laura, Leonora Neville herself said, you know, even if we start using like for like medieval, just medieval as a world term, instead of the say medieval West and medieval East or medieval whatever. Um, I mean, this will allow us to start looking at each other's research because the West did have contact with what is the Byzantine Empire throughout its history. And so by how we separate it, it kind of makes us not look at Western scholarships work and vice versa, right? And so I think by doing that, we breaking these um, labels down to and removing the colonial kind of labels that we will definitely help interdisciplinary work. Well, that's fantastic. I agree with you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, Kelly, I saw that your hand up was for, your hand was up for a second. Um, do you still have a question? Yeah, it's um, kind of a sidestep from what we're currently talking about. But um, I'm just curious, so the De Hess site that you were talking about, um, and I think that that picture is of the site. I'm, I'm curious, yeah. um, like I'm, I'm not a classicist, so I don't really know, but, but in your work of... Um, like looking at identity, how, how do you build an understanding of a culture's identity based on a geographical site? Like what things are present that um, build this narrative of, of who was inhabiting that and, and what their identity might be? So the way I approach that, I mean, the picture that I was showing you is of the dead cities. It's not exactly De Hesse itself, um, but the, the, 
it, it really is a multidisciplinary kind of thing. So you're taking the archaeological evidence and combining it with the literary sources and not just Byzantine or Roman sources. You got to look at um, the Syriac sources. We have to look at the Jewish sources. We have to look at the um, Armenian sources and so forth and, and just bring all this stuff together to start getting a sense of how they talked about each other. And then from the archaeological data, um, start looking at what is being recovered in these regions and how these items are being utilized. Um, it's very difficult to apply ethnic identity to any um, archaeological material. It's extremely difficult, um, if, if not somewhat impossible in some areas. Um, so it, it's a problem that's like, it, it's, it's a daily struggle to do it. I mean, so in this particular region, we do have, um, you know, uh, pieces of uh, material culture that have Christian crosses on them. So we do, which does insinuate that there were Christians in the region. There's churches, there's, there's monasteries and so forth. But we can't just oversimplify it by saying they're all Christians. Mm -hmm. What does that even mean? You know, because even within this period, there's different forms of Christianity, right? You have this, the, um, the Maya Physites who are in this region and primarily in this region is Maya Physites. And so there are different form of Christian um, theology that was actually combative with the Chalcedonian Christians who are primarily most of the Roman empire. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes very difficult um, even when using terms like Christian because it, it's a blanket statement. So we have to be very careful how we nuance it but I, I, I don't have a, a specific answer that could help you with that because it's, it's a day-to-day -day struggle, even with the research I'm doing now for my thesis, that trying to find identity in the settlement because it's such a um, complex uh, uh, settlement with many uses and many functions. Mm -hmm. Who comes through these regions is hard to say. Mm -hmm. Well... It's interesting just that um, it sounds like the, the work to build this idea of identity is so multidisciplinary. It, it kind of um, leads to like how classics can be interdisciplinary also in, in its relevancy kind of in our in our day to day life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and this is part of what we need to do as the kind of, you know, the new generation of scholars coming into these fields, not just in Byzantine studies, but in classics and any, you know, medieval histories and so on and so forth, is that we need to start really collaborating with other disciplines. We need to start breaking down these walls of these little niches that we're all in and start going, okay, well, I need to look at the anthropology. I need to look at the sociology. I need to look at the archaeology, you know, all these disciplines. We, we need to kind of come as one humanities discipline, I think. And start really breaking down these walls so we can start really understanding how um, early scholarship has kind of promoted Western views and then start breaking these down so we can start going into a more holistic approach. Perfect, so we have one last question for you, Scott, and this one comes from Lisa. And she's asking, could you elaborate a little more on the complexities of identities and how, for example, would you handle non-Arab converts to Islam? Does this exist, for example, at Dehes? Yeah, so some of the, some of the sources um, that I wasn't able to get into actually mentions um, uh, people uh, converting over to, um, the, uh, to, the, to Islam once the invasions happened, right? Um, so at one particular battle, um, and I, I apologize, I, it's the name just slipped my mind, but there are captives who actually say in the sources, oh, you know, we, we were forcibly um, uh, made to um, join the army and fight against you. We actually are, who, you know, we are Arab, we are, uh, we, we we follow Islam, but this is a very early source, so we have to question even the motives of the people who are writing these sources, and to um, you know try to create a a uh, more full identity of who they are in terms of the Muslim invasions. Um, so it's um, yeah, it's 
it's again when it comes to identity we have to take into consideration how these people perceived identity compared to how we perceive identity so there's language is a major component of this um when we talk about culture and the cultural heritage, we have to really dissect and be careful how we even apply these terms to these people, because each group would think differently of what their own ancestry is. Um, there are terms like genos, which you know can refer to race and ethnic identity, but what actually constitutes that is also difficult because in different regions, some like I noted earlier, where you know some will base it on the type of clothing people wear um you know the weaponry and so on and so forth but these some of these are also western uh, groups so can that stuff be translated over to the eastern regions of the um of the world as well and that's a difficult question to answer so i mean identity is just an insanely difficult thing to tackle and this is why i like it so much and why i want to explore it more because it is so um um uh, diverse, I guess, is the best way of saying it, and very nuanced and very regional, right? It's very regional. And this is something that's coming up in Byzantine studies is start looking at these kind of things in a regional scale and very localized and a nucleated scale because it does change from town to town at times. I don't know if that answered your question, but I hope it did. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, we'll let you off the hot seat, Scott. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> and we'll move on to our second speaker in our first graduate panel. So for our second speaker, uh, Safia Boutaleb is a graduate student of the Classical Near Eastern and Religious Studies Department at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Her current research centers around the socioeconomic contributions made by women on the island of Cyprus during the Late Bronze Age. As a young scholar of mixed ethnicity, Sefia's endeavors to align her academic studies with gender archaeology, a growing subdiscipline which aims at shining a light on historically underrepresented individuals within the archaeological record. By straying from traditional lines of academic inquiry, gender archaeology highlights the many socioeconomic contributions made by women, children, the, elder the elderly, and disabled throughout history. Thanks so much, Sefia, and over to you. Thank you, Sydney. Someone might, an, an arm might emerge and put a coffee down, just, just a heads up. Um, let me just share my screen. And can you guys see everything? Yep, you're all good. Perfect. It's always weird with these things, isn't it? You never know. It's a lot of navigating the social Zoom. Okay, here we go. So hi, everyone. Thank you. As said previously, my name is Sophia, and I'm going to be presenting my research on interpretatio in the late Bronze Age and how we might look for it in the 21st century. But first, I'd really like to extend a big thank you to the Clare Graduate Symposium and the University of Calgary for having me and providing this space for all the presenters to share their incredible research. Uh, the work and organization you guys put into this really shows, and this conference was something to look forward to, so I really appreciate that. And I'm coming from Vancouver, so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Stolo people. The land I'm situated on has been a place of learning for these Coast Salish nations who, for millennia, have passed on their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next on this site. And given that the theme of today is bridging the gap between the past and present, I've actually added a link below, which I can put in the chat if anyone's interested in familiarizing themselves with the traditional Musqueam place names of uh, the Lower Mainland in British Columbia. It's a really cool resource and it has pronunciation as well. So you will see in a moment that this research uses a number of theoretical perspectives, uh, specifically cultural entanglement and standpoint theory. If you're unfamiliar with them, don't worry. I am going to explain what they mean and how I'll be applying them to my research after addressing my first research questions. So what am I researching? Um, my research looks at the process of interpretatio between the Egyptian god Seth and Syro-Palestinian god Baal in Egypt during the Late Bronze Age. I do this through the lens of cultural entanglement as opposed to hybridity to better understand how this translation of deities came about. I highlight the significance of multiculturalism 
in fostering this entanglement during the late Bronze Age and recognizing the prevalence of religious and cultural interconnectivity now in Southeast Asia, I ask the question, could interpretatio still exist? Is Singapore, given its diversity, a viable future case study? And finally, by presenting my own standpoint, I acknowledge any insights and biases that I may possess throughout this process. So you're probably thinking, what? <laughs> Interpret what -io? Is she just pronouncing interpretation with a fancy accent? No. Um, interpretatio is a term used to define the process of translating deities in antiquity. More specifically, the recognition by one culture of a deity belonging to another culture. It was first used by Tacitus as in Interpretatio Romana to describe the translation of Germanic gods to Roman gods. In scholarship, the process is often interpreted as a kind of equivalence wherein one god is seen as becoming another god or where one god adopts traits of another god. My preference is for the latter, and I'll explain why. Throughout my research, terms like interpretatio egyptiaca have come up a lot. These cultural indicators are meant to indicate the direction of translation. So in this case, the translation is of a foreign god being interpreted as equivalent to an Egyptian god. But I think it's important to remember that identifying and interpreting interpretatio is in itself a form of translation from ancient to modern, requiring an intimate familiarity with the cultures involved, which realistically is simply not feasible for cultures in antiquity. While we can familiarize ourselves to the best of our ability with the ancient world, we can't know the nuances or choices that come with individual worship. So I'm choosing not to include these cultural indicators and use interpretatio by itself simply as a means of acknowledging religious exchange of deities as a whole, echoing in many ways the principles of cultural entanglement, which I will discuss next. As the name implies, cultural entanglement can be defined as the interaction of multiple cultures. For my fellow archaeologists of antiquity, you may be more familiar with the term hybridity, as this has often been used in scholarship, particularly describing material culture that illustrates cultural overlap. But the term cultural entanglement actually developed as a reaction against the term hybridity. This is due to the fact that hybridity has traditionally been used to describe the merging of two distinct cultures to form one blended culture, a kind of A plus B equals C model. But the problem with this model is that if we accept hybridity, then we also are accepting the existence of purity. And given the complexity of religious interaction, any terminology used to describe it can't rightfully include inferences of purity. So by adopting the all cultures are a mishmash model of cultural entanglement, the clarification becomes that no one culture is dominant and no one culture is the sole recipient of another culture. Both cultures, which themselves are made up of many entangled cultures, influence each other in a series of dynamic interactions in both public and private spheres. It's a much more realistic approach to cultural exchange and it removes a lot of colonial biases that typically influence our need for some kind of cultural hierarchy. And last but not least, standpoint theory. Standpoint theory is a research frame, a feminist research framework, which calls on scholars to look inward at the culmination of their life experience to determine how it may have shaped implicit biases within them and influence their perception of any given field of study. The practice highlights not only the prevalence of socioeconomic privilege, but also sheds light on the unique insights held by scholars and individuals belonging to marginalized communities. This last insight is referred to in academia as inversion thesis. Now, while we obviously can't gain the insight into the standpoints of our ancient sources, standpoint theory may still be of value, especially if we consider the perspectives of individuals raised in multicultural households or communities who may have a better shot at familiarizing us with the processes behind interpretatio in ancient and possibly modern contexts. So in the interest of academic accountability, I will briefly present you with my standpoint so you know where I stand as I engage with my research. As a cisgendered multi-ethnic woman, I have experienced both privilege as well as discrimination against my sex and mixed Arab heritage. I was, bo I was born and raised in Canada, a developed country, which meant that I had access to many things that others didn't. And perhaps most relevant, 
My British and Moroccan heritage determined my upbringing as a member of two religions, Anglican Christian and Sunni Muslim. As is often the case with multicultural households, I developed ways of engaging with my own cultural entanglement. This often entailed speaking two languages, praying at two different places of worship, participating in different cultural holidays, and as a half Muslim, the selective consumption and concealment of pork and alcohol. These nuances of my own cultural experience inform my inquiries into interpretatio, as I recognize the significance of individuality within spheres of multicultural interaction, particularly within worship. Although my experiences are not necessarily reflective of the experiences of other multi-ethnic individuals in the late Bronze Age or even 21st century, they do provide me with a standpoint which may prove advantageous in this study. So now that I've established my standpoint and introduced you to the theoretical frameworks, it's time to put them to action. In the next slides, I will demonstrate how centuries of cultural entanglement in Egypt fostered the development of interpretatio between Seth and Baal. But first, a little background to get you situated. The Late Bronze Age was a period of heightened interconnectivity across the Mediterranean and Middle East. It was divided into a hierarchical series of cultural states governed by kings, the most prosperous of which for a time was Egypt. I've got little Google markers so you know where I'm talking about. Some dates there. The historical context, according to the ancient Egyptians, tells of how the new kingdom began with the Egyptians driving out the foreign invader Hyksos population, who had ruled during the preceding Hyksos period from the capital city of Avaris, seen here. By regaining control, the Egyptians reunified Egypt under the rule of one pharaoh and restored order to the land. However, the new kingdom would actually be a period in Egypt's history of unprecedented militarism. With its shiny new professional army, Egypt expanded its influence into the Levant, exchanging goods, ideas, and gods. The Egyptian version of the events also don't really line up with the archaeological evidence at Avaris. In fact, it's become increasingly clear that the Hyksos, or Syro-Palestinians as they likely were, were, uh, were uh, represented a community of people from the Levant and Middle East who had gradually immigrated to Avaris prior to the Hyksos period, bringing their culture and gods with them. And they immigrated centuries prior. And here's an image of a Hyksos man from a tomb in Egypt. And it's at this site of Avaris, with its centuries of rich cohabitation between of history between the Egyptians and Hyksos that we find evidence of cultural entanglement and interpretatio of the Egyptian god Seth and Syro-Palestinian god Baal. So looking at interpretatio, let's start with Seth. His origin is ancient Egypt, so he's a local god. As you see on the far left, he's portrayed in anthropomorphic form, so half man, half animal. He was traditionally portrayed negatively as a disruptor or disturber of the Egyptian pantheon. During the Middle Kingdom, his name even functioned as a determinative in hieroglyphs for what Egyptians would have considered negative words, like disease, disruption, aggression, loud noise, and foreigners. However, Niv Allen, an assistant curator at the Met, has noted a fascinating shift in attitudes towards Seth, which began to take place after the Hyksos period. So here what we're seeing is a figure created by Allen in which Egyptian words associated with Seth dating to the Middle Kingdom before the Hyksos period can be found on the left. And words associated with Seth dating to the New Kingdom after the Hyksos period are seen to the right. The size of each circle indicates the frequency of the word's use. What, was no what Allen sorry, was noting was that the New Kingdom was that the, in the New Kingdom, after the supposed expulsion of the foreign Hyksos, Seth began to take on qualities previously associated with Baal. The catalyst for this may have been Seth's associations with aggression, loud noise, and foreigners. Not only did the meaning of the words change, but the frequency of his mention increased as well. Associations with weather disturbance began to appear alongside the Seth determinative, and words related to aggressive behavior increased, while words connected to illness and suffering declined. Favor for Seth progressed so much that the pharaohs Seti I and Seti II took their names from him. So since Seth is taking on all of these Baal qualities, let's look at some of Baal's characteristics. <laughs> 
He's a Hyksos god, so of Syro-Palestinian origin. He was depicted as a male warrior, which connects to the Seth words of powerful activity and uproariousness. He was the Lord of Storms and brought rain and fertility to the land. So that connection of weather words we saw with Seth also goes with that. And he was depicted with horns. You can see them here. And take note of these because they will play a role in Interpretatio later in this presentation. He was a vanquisher of the god Yam, who was a Syro-Palestinian serpent god of lakes, rivers, and the sea. This conquering of Yam made him a patron of the sailors at Avaris, which was a harbor site. And on the left, you can see an impression from a cylinder seal where Baal is depicted stepping on mountains, defeating Yam, who's this cute little snake below. Cylinder seals were stone, uh, small stone or clay cylinders carved with religious or economic iconography and then rolled onto clay to leave an impression. You can see it here for those who are unfamiliar. They were relatively common in the ancient Middle East, acting like an ancient stamp or signature, but the imagery depicted on them can provide us with valuable insight into what images were important and recognizable in antiquity. This same cylinder seal was manufactured in Egypt, notably in the style of cylinder seals made in Syria. It was excavated from the archaeological remains of a temple at Avaris, leading some scholars to believe the temple was dedicated to Baal, meaning a local institutionalized worship. In fact, the myth of him vanquishing Yam was adopted for an Egyptian audience. Baal became so important to the Egyptian ideology that a relief inscription from the Temple of Karnak describes Ramesses II evoking Baal's warrior persona by likening himself to the god. Ramesses does this as a means to legitimize his own militaristic pursuits against the Hittites in the Battle of Kadesh. You can read it here. Then his majesty appeared gloriously, like his father Montu. He took his panoply of war and girded himself in his coat of mail. He was like Baal in his hour. Clearly, Baal's role as a foreign god didn't hinder his popularity among the Egyptians, to the degree that he was called upon by the pharaoh while battling foreigners. But the most frequently cited example of interpretatio between Seth and Baal is definitely the 400-year stele. It was erected to commemorate the 400th year of Seth as patron god and father of Ramesses II's royal lineage. Take note of the inclusion of Seth's strength and great war cry, as that's a development in Seth's character that took place after the Hyksos period and their inclusion of Baal. However, even with that notable detail, most of the conversation about the Steely surrounds the unusual portrayal of Seth, so let's look closer. On the right, is a close-up of Seth who was shown to the top left of the stele. I'm not sure if you noticed, but there are some significant changes to his appearance. He's lost his anthropomorphic shape and is instead portrayed here just as a man. Not only that, and it can be a bit hard to see if you don't know what to look for, but he's actually depicted with horns. And the tassel and kilt are also of Asiatic or Syro-Palestinian origin, whereas the scepter and beard are typical of Egyptian iconography. So what we're seeing here is a really clear example of not only cultural entanglement, but interpretatio. And I want to note that in this instance, based on the amended definition highlighted earlier in the presentation, there's no need to fall into this trap of which culture is influencing the other culture the most, because by adopting the entanglement model, we recognize that the exchange is going both ways, with Seth taking on qualities of Baal and Baal being adopted as a local god by pharaohs. The archaeological record is fragmentary, so the absence of surviving iconography exhibiting the reverse does not necessarily negate that this exchange went two ways. Now this is where we get to the relic or reality part of my title. Given what we know about interpretatio, that it both stems from and is a representation of cultural entanglement created in part by multicultural population density, could it still exist today? Does this blurring of lines between religions and deities still happen in the 21st century? I was trying to think of a good case study, some were small but highly multicultural with polytheistic worship and immediately Singapore came to mind. I was lucky enough to visit there in 2012 and I was struck by the proximity of different places of worship to each other. Now my expertise lies in the ancient, not modern world, so my findings are brief, but I really think there is room for further research into this practice, and I wouldn't be surprised to see evidence of interpretatio somewhere in Southeast Asia, and I'll outline briefly in the next slides why.
The island city-state of Singapore is located in the South China Sea between Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand, making it a crossroads of Southeast Asia. It's been occupied by many empires throughout its history, so it's got a rich cultural background. It's still extremely culturally diverse as well, with four official state languages, as well as Singlish, a widely spoken but unofficial Creole language. Also, for how small it is, Singapore is home to impressive religious diversity, which includes among its main religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Baha'ism, Zoroastrianism, and Jainism, among others. In fact, it's so diverse that the IPS, which stands for the Institute of Policy Studies, conducted a study from 2004 to 2007 called the Research Project on Religious Diversity and Harmony in Singapore. And the results were published in a 2008 book titled Religious Diversity in Singapore. So there's lots of resource for research there. And the research was done through interviews and surveys with the population, the general population. So you get that standpoint there. So some main takeaways from this whole thing. I'm a researcher of the past, and so that's where my expertise lies. However, part of the reason I began this research is because I find that we have a tendency to observe the past critically from a distance, whereas when we pause to consider that in the present, we may be engaging in many of these same practices from the past, like interpretatio perhaps, it can remind us of the humanity and recenter our focus from events that transpired a long time ago to people that lived a long time ago. Although I didn't have time to go further into Singapore, I still believe it's got great potential and I'd love to explore the intersection of religion there further. Having said that, I also think that we can look for interpretatio in any place. As long as we know what to look for and we find evidence of cultural entanglement, there is a chance for interpretatio. And finally, I'd like to leave you all with a question to reflect on. Does the application of standpoint theory and looking at contemporary cultures like Singapore give us a true look at interpretatio? Or are the two periods so temporally distant that interpretatio in the present would have little in common with interpretatio in the past? That's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Safia, for that fantastic presentation. It's definitely given me a lot to reflect and think about when it comes to some of my work that I'm connecting. Um, we have our first question here from Sydney that is, how can standpoint theory help to break down and acknowledge our own internalized colonial biases? Mm, great question. I think that, so there are debates. Some people think that standpoint theory isn't of use. I obviously, spoiler, disagree. I think that any practice of self-reflection is super important. And I think that's across the board, particularly with colonial issues. Um, there's this tendency that I alluded to in the presentation um, and maybe you're getting to that, Sydney, that when you come from somewhere that has colonized some place, like we have and I have, you have this, I don't know why, but we have this need to apply this hierarchy, this cultural hierarchy, who's dominating who, who's influencing who. And so I think that it's important to acknowledge that. And when we think about our own role in colonialism and our standpoint in that, I think it can affect the way we're looking at questions and the questions we're asking. We can think, okay, why, why am I looking for a hierarchy? Why am I looking for one culture dominating another? Maybe it has roots in this practice that I'm part of whether or not I like it. And so I think that standpoint's very important. And as I mentioned before, also to recognize um, underrepresented communities and the standpoint that they have might be advantageous. And it's just another excuse to be more inclusive in scholarship and interdisciplinary as uh, Scott was saying. Fantastic. Now a question from Lisa from the chat. Do you think we also need to follow through with terminology we use to describe entangled relationships? For example, you use the word patron to discuss what a god oversees. Um, I'm going to open up to read that. Oh, thank you. That's easier to read it. Okay. You could just call it terminology. Um, I think that terminology is definitely important. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I think that the more transparent you are with terminology, for example, if you find it problematic or if you want to elaborate on how it's entangled or perhaps the term you're using 
works well for what serves you well for the purpose that you're doing, but you want to address that it has problematic aspects. I think as long as you're transparent about that and you address those aspects, I think that it's okay to use terminology. But I do think that in general, we should always be mindful and yeah, talk about where those terms come from, what kind of past they might have. Should we look at other terms? Yeah, I'm sorry, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Perfect. Now a question from Scott. You can feel free to unmute whenever. All right. Hey, that was a great talk. I, I mean, some of the stuff I've, I've never really even thought of before. So I think it's, it's fantastic and um, something I'm definitely going to look into for my own research for sure. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are in terms of modern language being used to interpret the past and do you think we actually can ever really come to the truth of things, which is really in, in essence is what we're looking for is facts and truth mm -hmm. about the past is that, do you think our language is, even allows us to have that capability to be able to interpret the past? That's a great question. And that's a complicated answer. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the solution. I think that, I, I, I definitely think that it's problematic using, I mean, it's really honestly, if I'm being honest, it's problematic me even studying this stuff because I'll never get rid of all of this, you know, my perspective as someone living in the 21st century as a woman, all of my standpoint is obviously going to influence how I'm reading the past. And so we can't get away from that. Um, and so terminal, I mean, language is all going to be part of that as well. So again, I think the only solution, and you talked about this, Scott, as well, is to be transparent and to address the issues mm -hmm. and to kind of say, look, this is where I'm coming from. This is what we're doing. Here are the problems but here's what we've got. And if we wanna do the best research we can and do justice to these people, particularly when you're studying underrepresented people from the past, um, I think, yeah, the only thing you can do is, is really be candid about it in your scholarship. Um, and it sounds like you're all on board with that, which is great. I love seeing that movement, but it is, it's difficult. It's difficult with language um, and it will never perfectly fit or apply, especially if it's developed now. All right, thanks. And we have another follow-up question from Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, she says, do you think that if it aids in such a colonial break uh, down, sorry, I'm butchering this. Do you think no. that if it aids in such a colonial breakdown that it should be incorporated into the majority of humanities research so as to further acknowledge the harm of internalized colonial biases? Standpoint um, theory, yes. I, I mean, again, I, yes, I, I think that standpoint is useful. And I think that it's important to, yeah, just self-reflect. And that's ultimately what I think it boils down to um, is a self-reflection of your life experience and acknowledging that that will affect your research and the questions that you're looking for and how you're interpreting it. So yes, I would say uh, I, if I were teaching a course, I would absolutely address standpoint. When I discovered it just like last year, it blew my mind. I was like, this is so obvious. <laughs> like, this is so obvious. I can't believe there's a term for it. Like, be reflective. Perfect. And then one last question from Scott. Yeah, sorry. Um, do you, can you suggest any um readings actually that would uh, point us in the right direction for standpoint because yes. some of this like I said this is new and it's very fascinating stuff so yes let me open my Zotero quickly but the author um so she's a philosophy professor actually at UBC and her name is Allison Wiley and she's a, a feminist archaeologist philosopher genius lady and uh um she writes about standpoint theory at length um so if you look up Allison Wiley W-Y-L-I-E. Um, she has quite a bit of writing on it. And she, I think there are also some lectures you can watch on YouTube about it as well, which I prefer. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Well, thank you again so much, Safia, for that fantastic presentation and your wonderful insight um, into standpoint theory. I think that's something all of us are gonna be looking into more now within our research. Thank you so much, everyone, and great presentation, Scott. Thanks.